Hello! So, this is going to be a very long video where I describe to you this class that I'm organizing or facilitating in biosemiotics. I'm going to be teaching it at SUNY Binghamton, I suppose, but it's really, it's an online class. It's a virtual class. So if you have a computer with a webcam and internet and you want to take this class with me, you can. Isn't that cool? I think that's pretty cool. It's, uh, it's the future here, here and now. Yeah. So, what is biosemiotics? And now I'm gonna read a little bit what I wrote, but I hopefully it won't be too clunky. Um, so, biosemiotics is a very new field, and I don't think that it can canonically be defined as a single system of thought yet, and maybe never. Um, but here's how I choose to define biosemiotics for myself and for this class. Biosemiotics is the study of what Evan Thompson calls the deep continuity of mind and life. The idea is this, there's a thing which some of us choose to call consciousness. And as a society, we can't really agree on what this thing is, and hint, it's not a thing, <laughs> not a thing at all. And so we give it other names like soul or awareness or self or spirit or genome or God or mind or personality or character or Atman or Brahman or lots of lots of names. So these names, they range on a spectrum from religious to secular to clinical and scientific. And in my opinion, they're all trying to point at the same thing, but even though, or, or they're, sorry. In my opinion, they're all trying to point at the same thing, even though some of them have mutually exclusive definitions. So for example, the word Atman usually means precisely the opposite of the word personality. Um, so this is a problem. And I see the deep continuity thesis as a response to all of this rhetorical confusion. So here's what deep continuity says. It says, if we want to get to the bottom of the matter, the bottom of the matter of this thing, thing we call consciousness or mind or Atman, it would be a mistake, a grave mistake to start at the end. Human minds with their symbols and language, they come at the end of the puzzle. They came into existence only after four billion years of evolutionary process. And there's something unique about human minds, for sure, but if we want to understand the thing that really makes them special, if we want to understand this thing, thing, that's responsible for the strange phenomenon called subjectivity, why are we subjective selves, right? If we want to get at that question, then we have to start at the beginning, at the origin of life. So, in a sentence, the deep continuity of mind and life claims that the origin of self and the origin of life are the same event. That shouldn't actually seem terribly controversial, but it does have some really fascinating implications. Specifically, if mind and life do share a deep continuity, then all meaning systems should have something in common. Well then, what's a meaning system? And that's, that's the question. That's the biggest question that we're going to try to answer in this class biosemiotics. Um, so, but for now, for now, let's, let's provisionally say that a meaning system is an interconnected network of associations, which taken all together produce a kind of paradigm. I don't quite mean the word paradigm in the way that Thomas Kuhn used it. I mean paradigm more the way, I guess, that Jakob von Uexkuhl uses the word Umwelt. It's like a holistic interpretation or a reification of reality. The Umwelt makes reality real by integrating it into a coherent system of purpose and organism. Um, so I don't know if that really gets at what a meaning system is, but I think, if anything, the fact that a meaning system is so difficult to define precisely says a lot more about what it is than any precise definition that I could give you. Um, meta, 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 meta. Anyway. So, if there's a deep continuity between mind and life, which I believe there is, then all meaning systems should have something in common. What this implies is that there's something about the way a bacteria and the way the bacteria experiences reality that's similar or akin to the way that I experience reality. And then, more controversially, it implies, it, at least to me, that there should be an isomorphism between the evolution and structure of the genetic code and the evolution and structure of symbolic language. So this is why we link the terms biology and semiotics, biosemiotics. So biology is the study of life, and semiotics is the study of signs and symbols and their interpretation. Another term lurking in the background here is semantics, the, the branch of linguistics and logic concerned with meaning. 
Um, but the words semiotics and semantics, they both developed in this really specific and kind of strange context of Western philosophy with a really peculiar preoccupation with the written word. So what we do when we add the prefix bio is that we compel ourselves to notice that these theories about meaning need not necessarily apply to just human symbols, and in fact, that would be ridiculous. And the entire tree of life is a pulsing system of meaning, or pulsing with many varied systems of meaning, which have a common root. So biosemiotics invites us to expand our linguistic notions of the word symbol to cover a much, much wider range of phenomena. And my hope is that with this expanded vision, we can uncover just a little bit more of what this mystery of self is. Yeah. So to go a little bit further, I'm particularly interested in this experience of becoming more than yourself, right? And in order to qualify that experience, you have to say what a self is. So what I mean by becoming more than yourself is, I guess, what is often talked about in, in a sexual or religious context that, you know, like in particularly good sex or, or in some like intense religious reverie, you, you feel like you are, you're, you're outside of yourself. You've become more, you've merged with the world in some way, with your partner or with God. Um, and so those are very high, high energy, high stakes experiences of, of becoming more than yourself. But I think it's also a much more common occurrence, even a daily occurrence. Like, for example, when we drive a car or use a tool, you might say that, that we extend ourselves, or at least a model of ourself, maybe, into the object. You know, I'm driving the car and I don't want to get hit, so I swerve because I know that, like, me and the car are the same in, in, in this way. Um, or another example is like when we finish the sentence of a close friend, you know, like you're talking to someone and then like they, they finish your sentence, you're like, oh, right? And, and it's so, such a nice feeling. And what's happening there is the hard work of thinking has become distributed between two minds, my mind and yours. Um, or here's, here's another example. This is, this is my favorite example. It's the one that, that, that keeps me awake at nights is um, human groups. So, you know, we groups have names like the Iroquois or the Romans or the Jews, and, and those groups, they also have distinct characteristics, phenotypes, right, that allow them to act in concert. Um, so could we say that any of these groups has a self? Like, you know, were the Romans, the Roman Empire, was it, was it a creature? Uh, maybe not, but maybe, I, I don't know. It's a question, right? So, so what would the relationship be between the self of the group and the self of the individual humans which make it up? And would that relationship between the self of the group and the individual humans that make it up be similar to the relationship between a single individual human and the selfhood of that human's cells? You know, all the, all the trillions of cells in my body, what is their selfhood and what is its relationship to me? And what is my relationship to you, or, or to my collective house that I live in, or to the United States, or to Judaism, or, you know, any of these groups that, that I, I guess I'm a part of? Um, yeah, so questions, long questions. So basically, in this course, what's going to happen is that we're going to take a really broad view at many different types of meaning systems, genetic meaning systems, religious systems, linguistic systems, mathematic meaning systems, and through this looking and through conversation, through conversing with one another, making meaning amongst ourselves, we're going to try to discover if we can find any meaningful correspondence between all of these different systems. And we're going to pay particularly close attention to those times in which the meaning system eats its own tail. So bear with me on this. I'm thinking about this, this really ancient symbol called the Ouroboros, which is the symbol of a serpent eating its own tail. Uh, it's really old, and it has to do with creation and destruction and all of these things. And my belief, right, my my the my conviction, or the the reason why I'm so captivated by this idea is that I believe that this self-consuming structure, this this Ouroboric pattern, is or or Gudelian incompleteness, right? There's lots of ways of talking about it, but my belief is that this Ouroboric structure is what gives meaning systems their meaning. And what gives cells of all kinds, bees or beehives or bacterium or humans, what gives all kinds of cells their selfhood? Um, yeah, so that's a really big claim, and I am not nearly qualified to defend it, uh, but I would like to be. And so that's what I want to get out of this class, is a more, a more robust and articulate articulation of the relationship between the Ouroboros and the self and how selves of different levels, be it superorganism or organism or bacteriophage, can, can come into existence in all 
live simultaneously. Yeah. So now, how would I tell you a little bit about what we're actually going to do, right? So that was 10 minutes of, of, uh, 10 minutes of philosophizing, but now let me tell you about the class. So the class is going to be online, and it's going to consist of reading, about maybe three to six hours of reading a week, and then two hours of video discussion on Google Hangouts. And those video discussions will also be recorded and live streamed so that people in the distant future can, can see what, what we're saying. And all of the assignments in the class are going to be video based too. So it's going to involve talking to a webcam for, for two or three minutes like I'm doing now about, about the reading. Every week you're going to talk into a webcam for two or three minutes about what you read. And then we're going to talk about that. We're going to watch all of our videos and talk about them. So very video interactive kind of thing with, with a, a pretty serious stream of readings. Um, so now I'm going to tell you about the readings, right? So we're going to start with the work of Terence Deacon, who I was studying with in California a couple of years ago, and also his collaborators, Jeremy Sherman and Tyrone Cashman, who live out there. Um, so Jeremy and Ty have agreed really kindly to facilitate the discussion when we read uh, the things that they've written, and it will lay the foundation of everything else to follow. So we're going to spend the first five weeks focusing on, on Deacon's teleodynamic theory of self and meaning. And when we move on to other ideas, we're going to be sure to really keep these concepts close, close in mind because they, they really tie into everything. Um, then week six and seven, we're going to spend reading excerpts from The Language of the Goddess by Maria Gimbutas. This is an archaeology book. And uh, it might seem like a really abrupt jump, but there's a line of continuity here. So let me try to explain it to you. The language of the goddess describes the evolution of a meaning system which bloomed and decayed all before the advent of the written word. It's 2500 BC to 3500, 2500 BC to 3500 BC for those of you who care about dates. So, so at 5,000 years ago to 30,000 years ago, um, math numbers. Anyway, we we still bear all these fossilized remnants, these anecdotes from from this from that older symbolic system in our culture. So I think it's really important to understand it. And I think that if we understand a bit how that symbolic system works, we can get a lot closer to understanding how meaning comes into the world more generally, right? And again, that's the question, like what gives something its meaning and how does that meaning relate to me and my identity? Uh, yeah, meaning is being. That's that's a thing that, that Maladoma said. Meaning is being. I think about that a lot. Um, yeah, so week eight, we're going to spend on Gödel's incompleteness theorem. Uh, this is going to provide a more logical and mathematical intuition for that Ouroboros phenomena that I was talking about before. And my friend Will Ramsdale is going to facilitate that class, so I'm really excited about that. Uh, and then after that, the schedule becomes a bit more fluid. Uh, maybe Julia Evans will be facilitating a conversation. Um, but we're definitely going to spend some time with Gregory Bateson and Lynn Margulis and maybe some Dog Hofstetter. And I'm going to throw in an essay of mine and some more vlog style videos like this one that are better edited for sure. And um, yeah, there's way, way more to read than we can ever get through. So I think maybe later in the class we'll try an experiment where we, we read a book of essays from, from the same author. Like I've got this Lynn Margulis book with a bunch of excellent essays and, and this Gregory Bateson book with a bunch of excellent essays, but they're all kind of disconnected. And I'm thinking maybe we might split it up so that we'll each read an overlapping portion of the book and then come together and see if we can pull out some, some meaningful trends out of it. You know, collective thought. Collective thought. That's another theme. Can we think together as a group through this screen, this little box? I don't know. I hope so. Um, okay, so one one final way that we might want to characterize this class is that it's gonna be it's gonna be a conversation and it's gonna be guided by just a growing list of questions. So here's here's the list of questions I have so far. Ready? So we've we've already covered the first few. What's a meaning system? I have no idea. What's a self? Uh, I think it's connected to a meaning system, probably. Um, now a little bit more specific. Can human social groups plus our domesticated species, me and my corn, uh, can we be considered selves or true organisms, you know, like Darwinian units of selection? Um, and if so, is there a rigorous isomorphism to be found between the evolution of symbolic language and the evolution of DNA? Might this isomorphism, might this isomorphism be required for a human social group to be considered an organism? I think so. Um, Here's another way of asking that question. In, in what ways is the function of symbolic artifacts in human society, stone tablets and, and smartphones, um, in what way is their function analogous to the function of the genome in a cell? 
And um, then also, what roles do boundaries play in the definition of self? And how does Gerdelian incompleteness or some other abstract version of the liar's paradox or the Ouroboros affect our self-other boundary, right? Because the, 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 the Ouroboros doesn't really have a self-other boundary, but it does, and it's, it's very paradoxical. Um, and then where does meaning come from? And how, how does it get here? How does meaning develop? And um, also, what is, what is the role of repetition in the creation of meaning? So I have another YouTube channel called Infinity Every Day that I've been working on for about a year that I'm going to be doing a lot more work on this semester that, that explores that question about how, how meaning is created by the repetition of the same pattern over and over and over again. And so what is the role of time and repetition in, in the creation of, of full meaning systems? That's another thing I would love to talk about. Uh, if if there is time and if if you folks think that it's interested interesting um, yeah okay 15 minutes in we're doing okay <laughs> um, so the nuts and bolts of the class I'm gonna read this now so the class is gonna take place entirely online helped along by all these video sharing technologies that that are rather ubiquitous today and um, as an exploration of identity and meaning and the relationship to the physical world, we're going to be very mindful of the ways that meaning and connection and all of this stuff is, is being channeled through this virtual landscape, this little box. Uh, I want to be very aware of how the medium that we're communicating is affecting the ways that we can communicate. Um, so with that in mind, all of the work of the class is like the homework, so to speak, is going to be video based. Um, so that means there's, there's going to be readings, I said three to six hours a week, and then a two hour virtual discussion, but then there's also going to be a weekly homework assignment. So prior to each week's discussion, the, everybody taking place in the discussion, uh, should make a video. Maybe you want to write something, you know, what I wrote here is dialoguers are expected to write approximately 200 words, one short paragraph, which broadly summarizes the reading and highlights an interesting point. Um, and then this 200 word paragraph is to be used as a template or an inspiration or a guide for a video monologue like this lasting no more than three minutes unedited. This is not an edited video. It's 17 minutes now, but it's unedited. So footage can be recorded via webcam or camera and it will be uploaded. You will upload to this class YouTube channel, the same channel that this one is on, Evo TiVo. And uh, we're all gonna watch each other's videos and, and use them as, as fodder for our class discussion. So that's, that's the way it's going to work. We're going to communicate in real time with video and also in frozen time with video. And uh, then maybe also we'll have a final project, some sort of final essay or video project, uh, but we'll, we'll cross that bridge when we, when we come to it. Um, yeah, so that's, that's the whole thing. Uh, if you look in the description of this video, you will see a link to the full syllabus, which has the script that I was reading off of, as well as a detailed list of readings, page numbers, and, and things like that. And uh, yeah, I'm so excited to be doing this with you all, and I hope that you're excited too. Uh, these, these ideas are, are the things that keep me alive in many ways. and. I've wanted to share them with people for so long, and, and starting to do that feels really, really good. So yeah, let's, let's have a, a really good semester talking about self and meaning and communication. How does that sound? Does that sound good to you? It sounds really good to me. Okay. Bye.